I'm Dr. Kong Saktan Padgett. Today we're going to talk about Buddhism. Buddhism is an awakened way of life taught by the Buddha to free oneself from clinging to self-concepts or similar to a seven-mesh hologram generated by one's own ignorance from being blinded by greed, hatred, and delusion, which result in craving, causing suffering. The Buddha basically, um, his life was around the Ganges Valley in northeastern India and in southern Nepal, current day. He was born at Kalipapasadu uh, at Lumbini Park, and then uh, he attended enlightenment at um, Rajagir, Ogaya, and then uh, he taught the first sermon uh, at the Deer Park, Isipatana, and then he passed away at Kushinara. So these had uh, become the holy places of Buddhism. Of, of Buddhism. This happened uh, when he passed away at 2,565 years ago, or uh, this year is 2022, uh, Christian era. Or basically, this is 543 BC, uh, counting from the day that he passed, or Parinivana. And this basically. The Buddha was born at Lumpini Park. It's traditionally, um, the mother usually returned home to their hometown. Queen Sri Mahamaya was returning home uh, to Tevata City. And then uh, she gave birth to Sitada, uh prince. And uh, she was holding on to the sal tree branch and gave birth to Sitara. There's a vision that uh, the baby was, Sitara was able to walk seven steps. With each step, have a uh, lotus flower came up to receive his footsteps. He also point um, one finger to the heaven, uh, to the sky, and one finger point out to the earth, say, I'm uh, best in the world, I'm supreme in this world. I'm the oldest uh, in this world. This is my last life. So um, basically, it was a vision uh, like that, which signified that he will be spreading his teaching uh, in seven continents. Or oh, this could also mean seven factors of enlightenment from uh, mindfulness, that my investigation, effort, bliss, calming, um, mental concentration, and equanimous mind. <laughs> so he lived a luxurious life as cow prince for 29 years um, in a three palaces. At the age of 29, he went out of the palace um, and uh, he was secluded in the palace all the time under his father's uh, command, uh, not to expose him to any any sickness and death and so on. So um, at the age of 29, he asked his father to go out around the city. And uh, he encountered four sites of uh, aging, sickness, and death. And the fourth site was about the ascetic. Um, so the first three signs he was shocked he never saw that before he asked uh, his personal attendant Chana uh, will my father be like that my parents uh, would my wife be like that and uh, would I be like that and the answer was yes and he found the ascetic is very peaceful life and uh, subsequently at the age of 29, he renunciated, left the palace uh, after his son was born, which he named Rahula, meaning bondage has arrived. 
so basically, he tried self modification for six years as, a, as an ascetic, and he found it as useless. It's a precip- supreme. Um, he found it painful, wasteful, and useless. So he started nurturing himself um, to gain more strength and get better uh, mental power. So uh, under the Bodhi tree in the Gaya, Buddha Gaya in India, he uh, became, in, um, he was sitting down at the Bodhi tree. And that night, the Mara or the devil, uh, which basically his biased thoughts, uh, came by with huge armies, including uh, three armies of uh, three princes, um, his daughters, Lust, uh, Raga, Tanha, and Oradi. Raga means lust, Tanha means craving, and Oradi means jealousy. So the three troop uh, armies uh, shot arrows and throw spears at him. So he's basically paralyzed. Um, so he asked for the witness from Mother Earth of all his merit that he accumulated, his perfection um, that he had done through past lives. And she came out as a witness by squeezing her pigtail. And basically the water came out of her pigtail and flooded all those um, armies. And uh, arrows and spears turned into flowers could not hurt him. So uh, he became enlightened and that night, basically his own thoughts and the water from the pigtail of the Mother Earth basically is the mindful awareness. Mindful self-awareness. So basically he saw his own thoughts of uh, basically his house builder uh, craving or tanha, thought conditioning. Uh, he found his own seven mesh hologram. Uh, this guy doesn't need introduction. Kino Reeves played a Buddha in the Little Buddha. So he found his own thoughts of seven mesh hologram as a self uh, which doesn't truly exist. And then he cited this verses uh, Through the rounds of many births I roam without reward with our rest, seeking the house builder. Painful is birth again and again. House builder, I have found you. We shall build no more houses. Uh, all your rafters broken, the rich pole destroyed, gone to the uncon- un- unconditioned or nirvana, the mind has come to the end of cravings in the Dhammabhada 11. So basically, it's uh, it catches thought, thought disintegrate. Uh, so no more tanha or craving. Uh, which hidden with the, in, in the thoughts, the sneaky thoughts disappear, disintegrate. So the, the Buddha became enlightened on the full moon of the sixth lunar month. By dawn, he was fully enlightened at Bodhagaya, India. So the Buddha happened to be born, enlightened, and subsequently passed away, Parinivana, on the full moon, the sixth lunar month, lunar calendar. And this has become uh, the Buddha's day. His, uh, his enlightenment was 2610 years ago, or 588 BCE. It's called Vesak Day has been celebrated internationally. Uh, United, United Nations announced that May 16 is the Vesak Day, international holidays. Commemorate the remembrance of the Buddha. Birth, enlightenment, and Parinivana passing away. So what he, um, um, he enlightened upon encounter or uh, discover the full ultimate truth, uh, which basically is summarized the dependent arising 
in in basically it's a exemplified form. Basically, he became enlightened on different arising, how how suffering arise, and the end of suffering called nirvana, um, ultimate peace and happiness. So he be, he became enlightened on those two main issues and summarized as four noble truth, which is one is suffering. It's a result of my reaching out with, with clinging to self-concept. Um, the second noble truth, ultimate truth, is cause of suffering caused by my reaching out with, with desire, liking, and disliking. And the third noble truth is the end of suffering. The result of my seeing my clearly resume the norm of the equanimous mind. And the fourth is middle path uh, towards the end of suffering caused by my seeing my clearly. I mean, you gain mindful awareness, guarding the mind and catching the thoughts and thought die down, become clear with the equanimous mind. So the middle path or noble ethical path basically consists of morality, concentration, and wisdom. Uh, in practice, wisdom comes first with right view, right thought, Right speech, right action, right, right livelihood, uh, moralities, and right effort, right mindfulness, right concentration, uh, mental concentration. These are the threefold training of morality, concentration, and wisdom in the practical aspect. So, uh, enlightenment for arising, uh, ignorance from uh, not seeing the truth. It became a mental impulse, it tainted my mental consciousness, caused uh, imagination. Um, seven mesholograms, gram, six sense fear, i.e., a nose, tongue, body, and mind got corrupted. Contact feeling uh, were corrupted, become craving, clinging, becoming the thought, birth into the thought, aging right to the and then thought died down, grieves all of it. arising all the time. But with awareness, mindful awareness, it will cease this cycle. So I would no longer cease and therefore nirvana, ultimate peace and happiness, free from all suffering. This is called dependent arising or dependent origination. So two months later, he gave the first sermon Dhammajak Kapavatana Sutra uh, at the Deer Park in Saranath, India. Basically, he is setting, it translates, setting the Dharma view in motion. He gave the sermon to the five, first five disciples that used to serve him but left him when he started nurturing himself, thought that he gave up the effort. So um, he uh, taught them the middle path and uh, the four ultimate truth. And one of the first five disciples, the oldest one, attained first level enlightenment, became a stream enterer. This happened on a full moon, 8th lunar month, 2610 years ago. And Tambega Stupa is the monument that King Asoka, the emperor, the great uh, builders commemorating the first teaching of the Buddha uh, about 235 years later. Uh, and the things that rise, arise under the norm would cease as a norm. That was the Gotanya, the first disciple that have seen the truth. So the Buddha witnessed it there. He, he got witness to the truth that he has discovered. Uh, the secret of the universe and the the truth of the norm of the universe and life. This became Sangha Day because the first uh, monk and disciple uh, exists in this world, completing the triple gem, the Buddha, the teacher, the Dharma, the teaching, and the Sangha, was uh, the followers, the disciples. So what is the middle path? Basically, as mentioned, is noble ethical path. 
that avoid the two extremes of sensual indulgence and self-modification. Sensual indulgence, he did that for 29 years as a crown prince, plus uh, so six years of uh, practice as ascetic. He was in deep shana, mental, deep mental absorption, very peaceful, very calm, but it's not the right way. And self-modification, he tried for six years, almost died and found to be useless, vulgar, and wasteful. Um, so we deny eternalism of permanent self and deny nihilism or nothingness. Deny idealism or materialism, not clinging to your, the mental aspect or material aspect, liking or disliking the middle path. And, uh, but everything exists due to uh, cause and effect, interdependence. So um, that deny nihilism because things exist due to cause and effect. Also doesn't last forever, so deny eternalism as well. And uh, because everything exists in the universe are uh, impermanent, imperfect, and selfless in nature. Nine months later, on the full moon of uh, Eighth lunar month, uh, on the third lunar month, uh, 26 and 9 years ago, 1250 monks became, uh, came to see the Buddha unannounced. And all were fully enlightened one as Arahant. And then uh, all were ordained by the Buddha himself. And on that day, the Buddha gave the Padimokha, the three fundamental principles of Buddhism, one to avoid doing bad deeds, second to do good deeds, and third to purify one's mind through uh, insight meditation. So basically these are the core and the heart of Buddhism. The Dharma Day, the principle of Buddhism. He also talked about ideal goal of life should be the true strength is based upon tolerance or forbearance or kanti. Second is uh, Nirvana, is the supreme truth um, for all the wises. And third is priest would not kill. And fourth, uh, peacemaker would not harm others, but being compassionate and willing to help other people. Then he gave the three guidelines, uh, he got six guidelines as a third aspect of this sermon. A peacemaker, one not to harm others verbally, second not to harm them physically, and um, being third being disciplined, observe moral codes, and be moderate in consumption as a fourth, dwell in a peaceful environment, and sixth, diligently train oneself to purify one's mind. So, uh, human being, a unique animal, but how unique. <laughs> We have different similarity to uh, closest animal, uh, apes. Year 2000, a genome project, human genome project was completed. And uh, subsequently, 2005, chimpanzee genome project was also completed. Turned out uh, we are very close to apes, 97% to orangutan, 98.38 to gorilla. 98.7 to chimpanzee. In fact, chimpanzee was closer to us than to orangutan, and then uh, or, or, or gorilla. And all human beings, you and me, are 99.9% similar. Cannot be 100% because we are not identical twins, but we are 99.9% similar in the uh, genome. We have a skin deep difference, quarter from law and order. As you skin yourself off, you see the same thing inside. And uh, we all have four nucleoacid, four nucleic acid as our base uh, DNA, basis of our DNA, ATCG, adenine, thymine, cytosine, guanine. And we are 95% similar to dog, C. elegant, uh, teeny, teeny, uh, round worm for use for experiment, 74% similar to human. We are 50% similar to banana, daffodil, 35%. So plant has similar DNA as well. Um, the overall 
macaque also know how to use tools, rock to crash nuts, uh, orangutan mimic human by rolling the boat, uh, using saw, gorilla hunt no dip a uh, uh, branch in the water, a twig in the water to see the depth of the water, and a chimpanzee know how to use to a straw to catch a termite, uh, dip in the termite mouth and lick it when it come out. And human create um, concrete jungle, build cities with concrete jungle, and destroy each other in like in 9-11. So the Buddha said, the world you describe, uh, correct, sorry, the worldly subscribes to craving concepts of pleasure and pain without biased thoughts, basically. So nature creates human equally, but it is human uh, that make a difference based on the conceptual aspect is from Oprah Winfrey. All beings are but companions of birth, aging, sickness, and death, with no exception, the Buddha. Buddha also taught uh, four holy abidings, or virtue of divinity, loving kindness, compassion, uh, which is universal, universal love, sympathetic joy, or altruistic joy, and equanimity. So basically, uh, this old master saw the Buddha nature in this young novice. Uh, he served the young novice who has Buddha nature, Buddha seeds in everyone, regardless of age, sex, dress, nationality, literacy, dialect, profession, even religious belief. So the Buddha taught this middle path for 45 years and passed away at the age of 80 at Kushinara. At his, at his deathbed, his death, deathbed, he uh, stated, perishable are all composite things. One should perfect one's mindfulness and self awareness. Or work out your way with diligence, with mindfulness, self awareness, not to be reckless. And that was his last words of the Buddha. And uh, his holy relics is still present at the National Museum of New Delhi, India. Uh, most of this, um, these are like shiny bone that become relics uh, after being cremated. Um, sometimes like broken rice. Uh, these are the relics of um, my master who lived to be 98 years old. Rong Tabua Yana Sampando. This is from his hair turned to crystal, uh, his blood turned to gems, and his nail turned to petrified bone, and, and um, his uh, body fluid or uh, his saliva with those uh, like relics. And Buddhism spread into two main branches Theravada, the worthy elders from the original teaching. Um, from um, northeastern India down to Sri Lanka, and also spread uh, by King Asoka the Great about the year, um, Buddhist era 235, about um, 300 BC, BC, oh, sorry, um, Uh, 235 um, uh, before Christian era. And um, basically, uh, they are spreading to Burma, Thailand, Laos, and Cambodia. Uh, these are the main Theravada. Uh, in the past, they also spread to Sumatra as well, or Indonesia, Indonesia as well. The Northern School spread to China, back to Tibet also to Korea and Japan. In current day, Buddhism has spread to 
all continents from North America, South America, Asia, Europe, um, also uh, the subarctic of the Eskimo, Australia, and also in uh, Africa, in Uganda, it's also Buddhist monks, local people, or there is Buddhist monk. So the Buddha taught us because he found that human is an advanced being because it's capable of training oneself to perfection. And those who succeed, like uh, the top panel, uh, the relics of the Lord Buddha, uh, his bone and his blood vessels, and other part of his bone, his teeth, and so on, other part of his body. And the second set of relics is from my collection with one of the enlightened ones. It used to be like a um, shiny grain of rice, similar to that, turned into beautiful gems like this. Bruce taught one to practice by learning life through self-observation of your body, feeling, mind, mental phenomena. As the four foundations of mindfulness. And, uh, it's a lifelong learning process of uh, threefold training of morality, concentration, and wisdom, avoid doing bad deed, do good deed, and purify one's mind. So basically, his teaching antedated the 20th century of lifelong learning concept by 2,500 years. And a lay person observe the five basic precepts, no killing, including human and animals, no stealing, no sexual misconduct, no lying, no intoxicant. Monks observe 227 precepts, including practice celibacy, and in, some tradi in the Theravada, the traditional school is no solid food after noon hours until the next morning. And... Uh, Observe 227 precepts. Buddhism make a distinction between conventional truth and ultimate truth. Um, like this, uh, a dog's pedigree is $500, but the jewelry was $120,000. But to the dog, there's no value. So we cling to the worldly phenomena a positive that we like, a negative aspect we dislike, like fortune versus misfortune, fame versus obscurity, praise or gossips versus gossips, happiness versus unhappiness. So this is all but conceptual, conceptual perception. <laughs> So, why does one suffer? One suffer of one's own thoughts, by his thought that we cling to things because of the self-concept. Uh, there is a greed hit of delusion that embedded these thoughts. So basically, the true nature of mind is luminous, but tainted with transitory mental impurities. It's the, the saying of the Buddhist. Basically, it's not a true share of the mind. It's those mental impurity transit through your mind, but it never left because you let it home in. But you can see it and get rid of it through your practice. So you allow greed and illusion to self create burden from being slave of one own biased thoughts, tainted with greed and illusion. And result in craving with sensual desire, liking and disliking as the first noble truth. The second noble truth is cause of suffering. And end up with the first noble truth of suffering. So a person or being in Buddhist eyes is basically is a aggregate, a group of composite thing of body, feeling, perception, thought formation and consciousness. Feeling, perception, thought formations, 
our mental activities that exist with the consciousness, which is formless. Their mental activities, but the true nature of it, unstable, unbearable, uncontrollable. It generates self-image whole grand from uh, not seeing of your own bias. You know, generate this self-image whole grand that uh, result in uh, five aggregates of clinging. The Buddha stated that to be born is suffering, to age is suffering, to die is suffering, physical and mental ailment is, su- is suffer- are suffering, grief, sorrow, lamentation are suffering, depart from your loved ones, suffering, didn't get what one wants, but what one wants is suffering, got what one doesn't want is suffering. He said, in short, the five aggregates of clinging are suffering. That's the first noble truth. The first ultimate truth. And also hidden with this through your was a mark of and impermanence, imperfection, selflessness. There is no true permanent self entity. No being, no person, no self, no you, no me. It's suppositional. And we, um, you might set it uh, as if there is existing. Over 100 years of searching, neuroscientists haven't found any place in the brain where self is located. So basically, every person is hit with two arrows. First arrow of natural pain or aging, sickness, and death. Then we hit with a second arrow of mental suffering, which is self created. But the enlightened being only hit with the first arrow, called the Bhavatuka but not hit with the second arrow, no mental suffering, uh, which is, is through your thoughts and mental activities. Um, because he saw his own thoughts, so it cannot fool him anymore. It is Salat, Salat, Salatatut Sutra. Basically, how we perceive things and resolve the five aggregates uh, it's through six sense sphere, eye, ear, nose, tongue, body, and mind. Uh, I interact with sight, sound, smell, taste, touch, thoughts, with specific organ. You cannot use your eyes to hear. You, can, you cannot use your ear to see. It has to be specific, specific pathway and organs, which is also shown, shown in uh, real anatomy, too. Six sense sphere by itself doesn't function. Like that person has all this, but it doesn't function. You need uh, the third part, which is mind consciousness, corresponding consciousness. From a resting mind uh, called Bhavangajita, uh, repository consciousness, Alyavinyana. It activates uh, when your eyes see sight into eye consciousness, ear sound, ear consciousness, smell with nasal consciousness, taste with the tongue consciousness, and body consciousness with the physical contact. And uh, this five consciousness, when it wants to activate, also transmit to the mental consciousness, so it work together. So mind will interpret and determine what to do with it. So this is called uh, interactive mind. So it's a total of 18 elements Six sphere in three aspects, 18 elements. So neuroscientists also work out how we perceive things from external object, maybe a car, a pen, an iPhone, a laptop. Uh, it perceives through eye, your nose, tongue, while in my into your brain and also generate a sense of self. Six sense fear, as mentioned, have corresponding consciousness, contact, feeling, peer perception, and then bias perception, cra- result in craving, disturbing thought, and obsessive thoughts. And result in the bias thought cause the eye tag. self image hologram. In fact, the feeding pathway of the pure perception feedback to the midbrain is five times stronger than the input. 
uh, incoming uh, signal. So that's why we generate the strong 7 mesh hologram on the ITAC. Professor Damasio was um, a neurologist, uh, stayed in parallel with generating mental patterns for an object. The brain also generates a sense of self in the act of knowing. So, um, but the Buddha said, it's not such so, it's a sequential. Every sound bias, perception, and craving, uh, which is the second noble truth about sensual desire, liking, and disliking from the craving. But the Buddha said it's just a two step, not parallel. Uh, pure perception and become biased perception. And with that, it can kill all those biased thoughts. <coughs> Excuse me with mindful awareness. It's solving the erase of bias perception, bias thoughts. <coughs> and end up suffering the third level of truth. So one can train oneself and become aware of these mental activities. <coughs> Excuse me. Perceive thing in the perceptual processing active and neutral with the pure perception, not being trapped by conceptual processing, which is passive and biased and results in suffering. So neuroscience also found that brain process 400 billion bits per second of information by only aware of 2,000 bits per second. <laughs> uh, we, we Possesses many types of memory, brain process them in different way. This is the perceptual processing. Like when you see an object, it uh, lit up the visual center in the back of your brain, occiput, and then transmit to uh, transfer to uh, midbrain, supratemporal gyrus to interpret. This is called uh, perceptual memory focus on physical feature it only use 0.5 to 1% of the brain energy. On the contrary, there's conceptual processing region, which are the middle temporal gyrus, inferior temporal gyrus, and the frontal lobe of the brain. Conceptual memory emphasizes meaning. So with mindful, mindful, mindfulness, self-awareness, you can uh, suppress or get rid of this uh, conceptual processing. You're free of suffering in that way, mental suffering in that way. So, uh, and uh, this has been worked out, the thought process, about 2,600 years ago in Buddhism. Uh, when you see sights, um, it activates the, the eye organ and also the pathway visual pathway, it lit up the cortex from the the past uh, mental moment. It's, it's vibrating with the new thing that like you saw, flowers, lotus, arresting. My got arrested. The conscious got arrested. And, uh, it activate the the eye pathway visual pathway. It lit up the visual cortex in the back of the brain through uh, eye consciousness. And then it transmits to the middle part of the brain, superior temporal gyrus, for interpretation. It's called Santirana Chitta. Through color, shape, and position, movement, and then it determines uh, what tapanachita, which is uh, determining my, determining my would give the value and you indulge impulsion consciousness, seven steps, seven my moments, and now become pleasurable or unpleasurable, 
and then it memorizes it, good or bad, the Thalapada Chitra, two mind moments. So total of 17 mind mo mental moments, thought process called 17 step of Vitijita. This results in karma or action according to your intention. When you interpret and uh, indulge in it, you, you got intention, craving to get more or less, you know, create karma or action. So karma, volition is karma, that's the word of the Buddhist. So basically your eyes, uh, when your eyes see faces, or places, it lit up certain specific centers of the brain on both sides in the top row, which is the actual ultimate direct experiencing. But uh, the scary part is that when it's when you're by yourself or when you see something uh, similar, like you went to Hawaii for a vacation, lit up like a top row. But when you're by yourself or seeing something flash on TV, you your thought, you pull up those information in your brain, lit up the same focus in the brain uh, with virtual uh, thinking. It's not direct experiencing. So it lit up almost as bright. See, with it, uh, face, person, and places. As if you're directly ex experiencing. So basically, we in thoughts all the time, we deal with space and time. Uh, it's not real, but it's conceptual, virtual, versus ultimate phenomena. So uh, one suffer once on own thought, that my teacher, Lung Patien, stated that. And the Buddha said, past is gone, future hasn't arrived. Why waste time in it? That's how it become the basis of the ignorance, uh, not seeing the truth. One, uh, the first word, not seeing the noble. Uh, noble, four noble truths of not knowing suffering, cause of suffering, and of suffering, made a path to end suffering. And uh, the fifth one is not knowing the past. That means you're trapped in the thought of the past. Six is not knowing the future. Seven, not knowing past and future. Sometimes a stream of thoughts that deal with the past into the future, like someone um, borrow your money, never pay back you think of the past into the future, what you should do with him, so on. And uh, last one, not knowing that the current phenomenon in the present moment is dependent on arising, a law of causation is causing things to exist, like I got invited here, that's why I'm here. It doesn't come, I didn't come by myself. <laughs> that's the reason, that's why. So we daydream all the time in the default network. Like uh, especially when you, um, when the brain is unoccupied, like doing mundane thing, uh, it got trapped in the default network. Why perform mundane task? I don't have to explain what this meant. The lady was pouring too much sugar, because she was daydreaming. They call brain dark energy. It consumes 60 to 80 percent. This is done at Wash U here and also at Harvard. 60 to 80 percent of brain energy was consumed. That's why it makes you so tired without lifting any finger. And this is the default net, uh, mode network. Basically, it uh, at the medial prefrontal cortex in the front and posterior cingulate cortex and precuneus in the back there and angular gyrus on the side. And uh, basically, this deal with self by remembering the past and planning into the future. So it's deal with the self or ego. It got you in trouble. So that's why we need to meditate to reverse engineering technique to catch one's thought as it arises. As mentioned, we perceive it a six sense sphere. And uh, we have the five aggregates to form a person, a life form, form, feeling, perception, thought formation, and consciousness. We dwell in these five aspects of life. So we meditate on form of the body, uh, self-serving the body, 
observing your feeling at the feelings. The perception with mindfulness and self awareness or mindful awareness and thought formation we observe at mental phenomena and consciousness we observe the mind, mind at the mind. So, uh, so when we gain mindful awareness, uh, right, right mindfulness, basically, with the pure perception choices, awareness, unbiased perception, perceiving without passion. Non-judgmental knowing, unknowing knowing. You know what it meant? It meant perceive without um, bias. Perceive with wisdom, not pro- no problem. Knowing without biased thoughts. In what when one encounters through your eyes, your nose, tongue, body, and mind. When you see it like this, uh, you come to witness. Gain insights into these three universal marks of existence, like body and mind, uh, impermanence, imperfect, and selfless in nature. Body's a physical aspect can easily recognize, but mind is formless. It's harder to recognize, but you can perceive it through uh, mental activities, mental movement, or your thoughts. You can catch your thought and make a thought disintegrate. You can see the changing nature, impermanence, unstable, imperfection, unbearable, and selfless nature, uncontrollable. It's obscured by continuity and movement and bundling. Obscure those three aspects. But you can see a, a, a child, a baby in a crib, a child, adolescence, young age, middle age man, old age, and death of this different chapter of life of this man. In my, you can see the thought as a seven metrogram that pop up in your mind that you generate whenever you think. And uh, so you can see the physical change that is no true permanent self. It's but come together, body, feeling, perception, thought, formations, and consciousness. So the Buddha taught this person, Paya, you should learn to understand as follow. To see, just see. To hear, just hear. Perceive, just perceive in what you see through your eye, your nose, tongue, body, and mind. And you realize, just realize that it's simply sight, sound, smell, taste, touch, thoughts without bias, unbiasedly. Paya, you should learn to understand as such. Then he re-emphasized, whenever you see, just see, hear, just hear. Perceive, just perceive, to realize, just to realize. At such moment, the so-called you will no longer exist. That's the end of suffering already. Both, uh, that's the middle path you practice. Whenever there's no you, you will not exist in this realm, next realm, between those realms. He said, that's the end of suffering. And Paya understood thoroughly. He attained enlightenment in front of the Buddha. The first, third noble truth. So we come to see the three universal mark of existence is not worth clinging to. Become disenchanted, disenchanted, liberate. Because it's all selfless in nature. No self, no suffering. All those biased thoughts that you been trapped in your brain, your mind, will be set free because it all disintegrates. No one to control your mind unbiasedly. With awareness, it can be liberated and it's accessible to all if you practice. So just don't believe what I'm saying. As the Buddha said, don't believe in external information, mere report, tradition, hearsay, whole scripture. Nor believe in internal bias like logical, philosophical, it's a common sense or met with your own idea. And finally, don't believe because of the person is a respectable person, he's a noble laureate, and the last one is don't believe because he's my teacher. So the Buddha make himself salvageable. He can uh, 
uh, discuss with him and don't have to believe it. You can practice to see it's true or not. So if it's harmful to other than oneself and condemned by the wise, that's not the path. But if it's beneficial to oneself and others and present wise, then it is the path. So one can perceive and uh, practice to the perfection of the mind. So mindful awareness unbiasedly or middle path towards inside wisdom and you can attain, attain enlightenment. Buddha said all beings have Buddha nature or Buddha seeds in there, in oneself. All beings are similar to the Buddha. All beings are the Buddha. So a lotus for you, a symbol of enlightenment and purification, a Buddha to be.